Now that brings us to chapter 2. And here you have the apostasy brought in by false teachers. Now this is a very important section. And I mentioned centrifugal force. Now let's talk about centripetal force. That is the force that impels toward the world today. It pulls in toward the world. It's a gravitational force today. And it is the pull of the world away from the Word of God. Now he begins like this. And the days that he's talking about have now come upon us. I read verse 1. He says here, "...but there were false prophets also among the people." Now, who is he writing to? Jewish Christians, and he's talking about Israel. "...there were false prophets also among the people of Israel, even as there shall be false teachers among you," that is, believers today in the church, "...who secretly shall bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction." Now, this is very important here. He says there were false prophets in the Old Testament, but there are false teachers today. And friends, we do not need to beware of false prophets at all. Any man that attempts to prophesy today, he'll soon be proven a liar. No question about that. During World War II, we had a man here in Pasadena predicted the end of the world would come, I think, on September the 15th, 1943. And when that day came around, reporters filled his yard and waited. And he had to come out at the end of the day and said he'd misfigured it. It would be September the 15th, 1944. Well, they were all back again the next year. Well, a great many ministers in Pasadena got excited at that time. Those of us that met together in a prayer fellowship, and they wanted to get a statement out to the paper. And I said, forget it. As far as I'm concerned, I said on September the 15th, 1944, he'll be a liar. And you know, the world didn't come to an end. And what happened was the reporters laughed, ridiculed him, and it hurts the cause of Christ today, of course, when anyone does that sort of thing. But the man disappeared from this area, and I don't know where he is today, but he may be out somewhere else predicting the future. Well, we don't have to pay any attention to false prophets. Well, let me say this to you. You need to check false teachers, and you need to check all teachers, including the one you're listening to right now. I urge people to check what we say by the Word of God. Don't believe it because McGee says it. One man wrote in, he says, I teach a Sunday school class, and anybody asks me about what I say, I say, well, McGee says it. I said, you got the wrong approach, brother. Don't do it that way. The Word of God is what you rest upon. And I'm amazed today how easily people are taken in why they fall for anything. And if you don't believe it, come to Southern California. Now, we have very modest headquarters here. They are adequate for us, and we thank God for them. He's been good to us. But you ought to go and see the headquarters and the operation of some of the cults in Southern California. My friend, you'd be amazed. It reveals that there are great many people today are not following this injunction that false teachers are abroad and they listen to them. Some wag has put it like this. Little drops of water, little grains of sand, make the mighty oceans and the beauteous land. So the daily pressures, subtle though they be, serve to shape the oddballs we call you and me. So that today... We oddballs down here, we are really taken in. Beware of false teachers. Now we have a more sure word of prophecy that's more reliable in your eyes or your ears. I was at the Parthenon, the ruins of it, there on the Acropolis in Athens, Greece, and I always examine this to make sure I'm accurate about it, and that is that there's not two parallel lines in the place. There's not a straight line in the place. If you go at one end and you look down, you'll see it comes up to a hump in the middle and then goes back down. The Greeks learn that the human eye never sees anything straight that is straight. And that's the reason I think God says to us we're to walk by faith and not by sight. 
After all, you can't even trust your own eyes, can't trust your own ears. But you can rest upon the Word of God. And the great proof that this is the Word of God is the fact of fulfilled prophecy. Now, over one-third of the Scripture was prophetic when it was first written. And it's not to be treated as speculation or superstition because of the fact that it has been literally a great deal of it fulfilled. Every 21 verses of Scripture is prophetic. And someone has said, prophecy is the mold in which history is poured. Now, fulfilled prophecy is to me one of the great proofs of the accuracy of Scripture. We have a more sure word of prophecy. That's what Peter says back here in the first chapter. And one-fourth of prophecy is fulfilled. That is, one-fourth of one-third of the Bible is fulfilled prophecy. And man can't guess like this. You see, there are 330 prophecies in the Old Testament concerning the first coming of Christ. They were all literally fulfilled. Now, would you look at that for just a moment? Man can't guess that accurately. I might say to you today, I'd say it's going to rain tomorrow. Now, I stand a 50-50 chance of being right because it's either going to rain or it's not going to rain. But according to the law of compound probability, I could be 50% right. I might stand a pretty good chance. Now, suppose, though, that I say it's going to start raining at 11 o'clock in the morning. That's added another uncertain element. Now I only stand one-fourth of a chance. Now I suppose I say it's going to stop raining at 2 o'clock. And that adds another uncertain element. And now that has to be divided. And I stand now 12 and a half percent chance of being right. Now you add 330 of those, friends, and see where you come out. Why, actually, you'd never have a chance of it being right at all. And that's the reason that some of the so-called prophets today, every now and then, they hit it. But these so-called prophets even today miss it. They miss more than they hit. And in Israel, a false prophet was stoned to death. If what he prophesied didn't come to pass, they just stoned him to death. That ended his career as a prophet. Well, here you have a book, and here you have fulfilled prophecy, and you can't gainsay that type of an argument. On the basis of that now, he says, but there were false prophets also among the people. Now, there were not only true prophets who prophesied, but we know that there were false prophets among the people. At the time that Ahab and Jehoshaphat went out against the Syrians, you will recall that they called in a bunch of the false prophets of Baal, and they urged Ahab to go. And Jehoshaphat saw immediately they weren't getting a word from God. And he says, don't you have a true prophet of God here? And he said, yes, I keep him though in prison because he never says anything good about me. A great many people don't like a preacher unless he just says something nice about them all the time. Well, that was Ahab. And this prophet Micaiah just told him the truth. So they brought him in, and he told him, he says, if you go to battle, you'll be slain. And Ahab turned to Jehoshaphat and says, see, he never says anything good about me. Well, it's too bad Ahab didn't listen to him, because he was slain just as Micaiah said he would be. But there happened to be several hundred false prophets that were there. Now, he says here, Peter does, but there were false prophets also among the people, that is, the people of Israel, even as there shall also be false teachers among you. And Dr. Vinson, in his very fine word study, says that this word for false teachers, which is pseudo didascaloi, this is the only place that it occurs in the New Testament, false teachers. Now, false teachers are what the church is to beware of. And as we said last time, we don't need to pay any attention to a false prophet. He's out of business the minute that 
you get around to the fulfillment of his prophecy, and you can pay no attention to false prophets. But false teachers are the danger today. And believe me, they are dangerous. Now, what is a false teacher? Well, let me give this definition. A false teacher is one who knows the truth, but he deliberately teaches lies for some purpose, either for some selfish reason, or he wants to please people, or he does it for money. And there are many that are like that today. They preach and say what people want them to say. And they're false teachers, and some of them know what the truth is. Now, that is a false teacher. Now, a man that does it ignorantly, and some of the great reformers of the past, and the post-apostolic fathers. Many of them believed and taught some things that we do not hold to today. We believe they were entirely in error on those things. Now, they were not false teachers. They believed they were teaching the truth. A false teacher knows what he's doing, and he does it deliberately. Because he goes on to say here, even as there shall be. Now, Peter puts it out yonder in the future because it would be beyond his death. Jude will cover very much the same ground here. And by the way, the very fact that Peter and Jude are so much alike has caused some of the critics to say one copied from the other. Let me state it a little different way. When God wants to emphasize something, he says it twice. And that's the reason when the Lord Jesus said, Verily, verily. I say unto you, one verrill is enough from him. But when he says it twice, you better sit up and listen. And so here, this is something that God considers rather important. But Jude says they're already false teachers. So they came into the church quite early, by the way. And they've been in it ever since. False teachers among you who secretly shall bring in actually destructive heresies. Now, the thing that actually identifies them is that they deny the Lord that bought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction. Now, I think that you have here in this verse a good definition of false teachers. They will appear in the church as members of the church. They will claim to be Christians. And they work secretly under cover of hypocrisy. I heard recently of a church that many years ago was a very fine, fundamental church. I preached in that church, and the people loved the Word of God. Well, they called a man to that church, and they questioned him about whether he believed the Scriptures or not, whether he believed in plenary verbal inspiration. And he agreed to every question they asked. And I was in that city. I won't say where it is. After that, about two years after that, and, oh, the members had scattered. They were going to other churches. And they said, this man, absolutely, he misrepresented. That's what the nicer people said. And some said, he lied to us. Well, that's exactly what he did. He came in, actually, and was a hypocrite. He said one thing, and he actually believed another. Now, they have some true doctrine. There's not a cult that I know of that does not have some truth in it. That's the thing that makes it very dangerous, that makes it 10,000 times more dangerous than if it was 100% in error. And these teachers generally believe some things that are true. And our Lord identified them as wolves in sheep clothing. And Paul, you remember, told the church in Ephesus, he says, I know that after my decease that there will come in among you wolves in sheep clothing, and they will absolutely destroy the flock, scatter the flock. Now, that is the thing that would happen. Our Lord made it clear when he gave a picture of the condition of the kingdom after his rejection and crucifixion and resurrection. He would not establish it then, but the kingdom of heaven would be like a sower, 
It would be like a mustard tree, and it would be like leaven. And leaven has got in today to the bread. The bread is the Word of God, and there's a lot of false teaching that goes out in that way. Now, these false teachers, they do it for a purpose, of course. Now, will you notice verse 2, "...and many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of." Now, they are pernicious, if you'll notice. These false followers will go after false teachers. And I do not believe, frankly, that God's elect can be permanently deceived. If you want to know why I believe that God permits a lot of the cults and isms, is to draw away that which is false, because those that are phony will go after that sort of thing. And that's exactly what Paul said would take place in 1 Corinthians eleven nineteen. Listen to this. For there must be also heresies among you, that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. In other words, the genuine child of God won't go in that direction. The Lord Jesus said, "'My sheep hear my voice,' and they won't follow a false one." Well, when you see people take out after one of these false teachers, they are either ignorantly deceived or they are deliberately deceived. That is what they believe. That's what they wanted to hear all the time. Now, if you'll notice here, there's something that is quite interesting in the next verse. He says, "...and through covetousness shall they with feign words make merchandise of you, whose judgment now for a long time lingereth not, and their destruction slumbereth not." Now, the word here is that they use feign words. Now, that word feign, and I have gotten down Thayer's Greek lexicon to look at this word feign, and I'm going to pass on to you what he says it means. The Greek word is plastos, and it means molded or formed, like clay and wax and stone. Now, plastos, does that sound like some word you've heard of? Yes, we have a new word. The word wasn't even in existence in Peter's day, and yet it was. Plastic. That's the word that he uses here, and I love that. Now, you can buy a plastic pitcher. You can buy a plastic bucket. You can buy plastic dishes. You can buy plastic toys today. You can buy a a plastic most anything today because it can be molded into any shape that is possible. And may I say this, and I want to say it kindly, and there are plastic preachers also that can be molded and shaped by the people that they serve. They say what the congregation wants to hear. And that's the word that is used here. And why do they do it? And I will tell you, Simon Peter just puts it right out here in the open and through covetousness. They do it because they are covetous. Now, covetousness actually is a form of idolatry today. They use these plastic words, and that's quite interesting. That was the thing that neo-orthodoxy, when it first appeared, deceived so many people. When I came to Pasadena, there was another preacher came about the same time. He was an outstanding liberal. I'll not call his name. He's known, I guess, pretty much all over the world today. And a member of his church attended my Bible class, and she said, Oh, he is sound in the faith because he uses the same language that you do. Well, I said, Fine, but does he mean what I mean by it? Oh, she said, He must. And so on Easter Sunday, she called me, Dr. McGee, you've been wrong in criticizing this man. He spoke of the resurrection of Jesus today. And I said, did you go up and ask him afterward whether he believed that Jesus was raised bodily from the tomb? And she said, well, I'm sure he meant that. 
I said, I'm sure he didn't, but you ask him. And she called me the next day, and she's weeping. And she said, you know, he just ridiculed the idea of the bodily resurrection. And I said to her, I said, you know, these fellas, they use our vocabulary, but they don't have our dictionary. In other words, they say one thing, but the important thing is it's not what they say, it's what they mean by what they say. And so they are doing it for a purpose. Sometimes they're covetous for a position, for a name, for popularity. A great many go after that. And then covetous of money. Actually, a great many are covetous in that particular connection. Now, I'm not today talking through my hat, friends. I have before me the statement that appeared in one of the very fine publications, Christian publications, and I'm not going to call names at all. And it tells about a service of a well-known evangelist, and I'm not going to give his name. I'm not telling very much today, apparently. Now, this is a service that was written up. The pastor introduced the speaker, and he says he's a man after my heart because he loves money just like I love it. And the evangelist got up to speak. He was forceful. He was dynamic. He put on quite a show. And for 45 minutes, he did not read one scripture, nor did he quote one text of scripture. He quoted partially three or four verses. He used the personal pronoun I 175 times. He only referred to Jesus Christ 11 times. And there was laughter every two minutes in his message. He was quite a comedian. And an invitation was given. Some 20 young people responding to the urgings of this evangelist, and they went forward. (laughs) For what? They never heard the gospel. And that is the thing that is abroad today in our land. The average church member, and I'm trying to say this kindly, but the average church member doesn't know the gospel when he hears it or when he doesn't hear it, which is more important. And that is the tragedy of this hour in which we live. Why? Because there are many false teachers. I could give you instance after instance that I am not talking about a theory, but I'm talking about the fact that there are false teachers abroad today. And that's the reason I said the other day, check on all of us radio preachers. Check on me. Am I teaching the Word of God? Well, check the Word of God and see whether I am or not. And I think that every child of God should examine himself to see whether he's in the faith or not. And that includes the one speaking to you today. Now, we have here, "...and through covetousness shall they," that is, the false teachers, they with feign words, that is, with plastic words, words that... They're just molded words. They fit the people they're talking to. They speak one thing to one crowd, and they talk differently to another crowd. And unfortunately, there are ministers like that today. I know a man that can bring a fundamental message if he's in a fundamental group. But when he gets with a liberal group, he's just about as liberal as they are. He's a plastic preacher. He just pour him in any mold, you see, and comes up with anything. Plastic is very nice, but I've learned several things about plastic. You better be very careful how you use it and that sort of thing. It's easy to push it and change its shape, especially if you put something in a plastic bottle and the thing gets smashed, the stuff will run all over the place if you're not careful. And so we have that word used here. And he says they'll make merchandise of you. In other words... They're doing it for money. And that's the reason that I personally resent all forms of promotion today. Now, every time I take a trip and come back, I sit at my wastebasket, and sometimes I will pitch in the wastebasket without opening letters because I know who they come from, the labels on the outside, and I've been getting letters from years. I've never given to those organizations but I get their propaganda. 
I don't know why they keep sending all that out. But I do know this. They want to make merchandise of me. Because actually, we ought to only appeal to folks that are interested in a certain work. And that's my reason for saying that if it's a mission organization, then you ought to be interested in that mission organization. And there are many fine mission organizations. And I want to say this, there are many fine radio programs, too, Christian radio programs. But there's some that are nothing in the world but promotion. And what we're trying to get through here is this, that one of the marks of a false teacher is that he is a promoter, that all he's interested in is not giving you the Word of God, not attempting to help you, but he is attempting to get something from you, makes merchandise of you. That is, he wants to trade with you. You are sort of a food stamp for him, or maybe a luxury car for him. Now, will you notice this? Whose judgment now for a long time lingereth not. The thing that has disturbed a great many folk, including those in the Bible, David was disturbed that the wicked were getting by with it. So he thought. Then he said, I went in the temple. And what did he learn in the temple? All he learned in the temple was this, that God was in charge. And he'll take care of it. And that's the reason Paul, Paul was, you remember, mistreated again and again. And Paul resented it. He would not let the Philippians turn him out of jail at night and let him leave town. He was a Roman citizen. He forced them to do it the right way, you see. But Paul says, don't take vengeance. Why? He says, because you turn your case over to God. And the minute that you try to get vengeance... You're taking God's place because God says, vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord, and you depart from your walk of faith. You see, when you walk by faith, it doesn't mean that you are a milk toast that everybody can push you around and treat you anyway. No, it means this. All right, brother, you have mistreated me, and you've done this to me, and I'm going to turn you over to the Lord. You remember Paul said, Alexander the coppersmith, silversmith, was it? Well, he's one of the smiths. He's done me much wrong. (laughs) And Paul says, the Lord will reward him. (laughs) The Lord will take care of him. I turned him over to the Lord, Paul says, concerning another brother that mistreated him. May I say to you, vengeance is mine. I will repay. The Lord says, you let me handle these cases. Now here, God's going to take care of these false teachers someday. I'll be very frank. When I heard of the death of a liberal not long ago, a great many, in fact, a man said to me, well, says he's better off today than he was when he was in this life. And I said, you just think he's better off. I don't want to go in the presence of God someday, friends, and have to give an account for the fact that on this radio program, God is going to say, look, McGee, you came to a passage of Scripture there, and you soft-pedaled that because of the fact that you were afraid of criticism, and you didn't say it like it's written. And he'd hold me accountable for that. I got to turn in a report to him for this radio program. And may I say to you, you've got to turn in an account to God also. Now, he says, this thing, it looks like it's slumbering. It looks like God is taking a nap today. He doesn't seem to be doing very much. But he is, friends. And Habakkuk had that question. And Habakkuk found out that the Lord is moving too fast for him. We'll see that when we get to it. Now he gives an example. And when I say an example, actually a threefold example. He gives an example of the angels first. Let me read verse 4. For if God spared not the angels that sinned. Now here is an unusual statement. You mean angels sin? Yes, angels sin. And this is an example of the way the devil works. Now he gives another example, and that's Noah. And he spared not the old world, but saved Noah. And that's the world. And then he gives the third example in turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes. That's the flesh. 
So you have here the world, the flesh, and the devil. Only Peter puts the devil first. The devil, the world, and the flesh. These are the three enemies that you and I need to beware of. And not only beware of them, John's going to tell us, and he's the apostle of love, he says, love not the world, the things that are in the world. That doesn't mean the beautiful flowers and the mountains and the scenery and the sea, but it means the world system down here that is against God. And he's going to talk here first, though, about the devil and about the fact that God in the past has judged angels. Now we're moving into an area that is highly debatable and very popular today. And there's too much attention being given to this. Books are being written today about Satan and about demons and that sort of thing, and I suppose they have their place. But my feeling is that we need the positive side emphasized more I have a message on who is Antichrist. And I always conclude that message by saying, well, you can see I don't know much about Antichrist, and I don't want to know much about it. The one I want to know is the Lord Jesus Christ, and I can't find anywhere Paul says that I might know the Antichrist. And I can't find any writer saying that I might know the Antichrist. But Paul says that I might know him the Lord Jesus, and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering. And it's life eternal to know God, the Father, and the Son, the Lord Jesus, that he sent. And I can't find anywhere where you to know Antichrist or to know all about Satan. We're not ignorant of his devices. We need to beware of him. But you can pay too much attention to that. But where it's found in the Word of God, I'm going to deal with it. And so here for a few moments, let's deal with this. Verse 4 again, "...for if God spared not the angels that sinned..." Now, there are a great many that consider that refers to Genesis 6. I do not, because I do not believe that the sons of God there were angels. I think it's the genealogy of man we're talking about. In Genesis, you have the genealogies. It's that family that was leading to the coming of Christ that would bring him into the world. And that line was intermarrying with the world, the line of Cain. And that brought about a generation that caused God to finally bring the flood. Now, I don't think this is any reference to that at all. The next verse up here will refer to the flood, but under altogether different caption, it's the world. Now, here it is the devil. What does it have reference to? Now, I'll have to do just a little bit of speculating, and yet Scripture gives us some hazy viewpoint of this. You were going to find that Jude refers to this again. The book of Revelation gives us some inkling, and several of the prophets open this area to us just a little. You see, before man was put on this earth, and actually man is a sort of a Johnny-come-lately on the earth. We haven't been here too long. And before man was here, apparently there was another creation that was here. And God had a program going before man appeared on the scene. And there were many created intelligences. Now, among those angels that were messengers of God, God's creation, some of them rebelled against him and apparently followed Satan. Now, we're going to be told here that some of them are already in chains. They are already incarcerated. But some of them apparently were not brought into that place yet of being inoperative, but they are very active in the world today. And I believe those are the demons that we read about in the Word of God. And I think that we're seeing today a reappearance of the supernatural. I have in my study at home a whole section of books that have come to me over the years on this subject. And I have been very carefully, meticulously, working on a message that I have not yet given and not ready to give it. Not sure I'm going to give it. 
on the subject of demons, because there's so much that's false that's going abroad today. But there is a reality in the supernatural world. And because a so-called miracle takes place today doesn't mean God did it. After all, Satan has a certain power. Now, this is a reference to that which took place before man was put on this earth, when there was a rebellion against God led by Satan, and we're told that he carried with him a tremendous company of God's created intelligences that we call angels. Verse 4, "...for if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell." Now, the word for hell here is an unusual word. It doesn't occur in very many places in Scripture. The word is Tartarus. It actually comes out of the Greek. The Greeks spoke of the lost being in Tartarus. And it is not hell as we think of it. Hell has not really been opened up to do business yet. Hell will not be opened up till much later. The devil is not in hell. He's abroad in God's creation today. He goes in the presence of God, according to the book of Job, and he goes up and down this earth seeking whom he may devour. Peter's going to tell us that, that he's like a roaring lion going up and down the earth. He's not in hell. But certain of his angels have already been incarcerated. And we're told here they're delivered them into chains of darkness. And here's another very interesting word. The word here for chain is serais. And there are many that believe that it should be serois, for it is that in many of the better texts. And serois means pits or caverns. The two words are very similar, say rice, say royce. And so, apparently, it, it means here that what we have are pits of darkness to be reserved under judgment. Now, I don't want to elaborate on this either today, but people think of hell as being a place of fire. But I think it's a place of darkness. And darkness and fire just don't go together. Fire makes light. And this is something for you to think about. Can you think of being in darkness for eternity? To be reserved under judgment. You see, they have not yet been judged. Now, that's the first example he gives that God intends to judge evil, the devil, that which is false. Now, we come to verse 5, "...and he spared not the old world." And he's going to talk in chapter 3 about three worlds. The world that was, the world that is, the world that will be. I have a little book. Now, that one we're sending to folk who send in a gift. At this time, we're studying Second Peter, and the title of the book is Three Worlds in One. And it's on Second Peter, the third chapter. We'll be getting to that. Now, he spared not the old world, that is, before Noah, but he saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. Now, the people were religious. They just left God out of their religion, that's all. The living and true God. They were living as if God did not exist at all. And they were living in the flesh. And believe me, the idea today that you and I in the flesh have some good, Paul says, that there's absolutely no good in us at all. Paul says, I have discovered that in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. I have before me a report that's made by Dr. Turnbull in his book, Mountain People. Those that have been discovered in Africa, and he's made a study of these people. And they absolutely are living, according to him, lower than animals. Children are cast off by the mother at the age of three. They must provide for themselves or die. They find berries and bark and insects, and they scavenge around what is left of wild animals. And the stronger literally take food from the mouths of the elderly. And the author said that it would be an insult to animals to call their behavior bestiality. Now, this man's not a Christian. 
and he describes these people. They are called the I.K., the Ick. The Ick teaches us. Now, this is what Dr. Turnbull, who's a humanist, he's not a Christian, he says the Ick teaches us that our much vaunted human values are not inherent in humanity at all, but are associated only with a particular form of survival called society, and that all, even society itself, are luxuries that can be dispensed with. In other words, man apart from God is nothing in the world but an animal, and it's an insult to an animal to say that man is that. You see, it's God that gives values. It's God that gives moral standards today. And none of them are inherent in us today. And it was that kind of a world that God destroyed at the flood. Every thought and imagination in the heart of man was evil and was evil continually. And violence was abroad in the earth at that day. And God did well in bringing judgment at that particular time. And maybe you don't like that. And I'm sorry if you don't, but you happen to be living in God's world, and this world is going to be run according to His rules. You can be sure of that. You can either conform or move out. And I don't know where you're going if you move out, but you have to go somewhere. Now, will you notice he mentions the third, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemn them with an overthrow, making them an example unto thus that after should live ungodly. Now, that's the flesh that God judged there. They were given over to sodomy. Homosexuality was approved in Sodom in the United States, probably the only two nations that have ever given legal approval to this awful thing that man indulges in. Until next time... May God richly bless you, my beloved. Now, friends, we're still in this very remarkable second chapter of Second Peter, a chapter that speaks of the apostasy that is coming on the church. And the apostasy is brought in by false teachers, and both the teachers and those that follow them will be judged. And I'm going to put in today at verse 5, and he's giving us now in the section where we are three examples of the fact that God has in the past judged those that are false and phony and pseudo-religious people, and that he intends to do it in the future. And the basis is given here. We saw first that it was angels, for if God spared not the angels that sinned. We don't know too much about that. We are told in Revelation that one of the most remarkable statements that is there is in chapter 12, verse 7, and it says, "...there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and that's Satan, and the dragon fought and his angels." And back in the past, apparently, there was a rebellion against God, led by a creature that we know today as Satan or the devil. He has many names. He's the great deceiver. He is a liar from the beginning. And this creature rebelled against God, and there followed him a great company of angels. Some of them, we discover, are with him today because Revelation says that those that are with him are to be cast down. Now, we also find that in the past, as we're told here, that they have been incarcerated waiting for the time of judgment. The indictment is made against them. In fact, God has declared them guilty and they're waiting for the judgment to come. They're reserved under judgment. That speaks of the devil. Then the world is before us in the story of Noah. And verse 5 says, "...and he spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly." 
Now, when it speaks here of Noah, the eighth person, it means Noah with seven others. He's the eighth. There were seven others that were saved. And that means Noah, his three sons, their wives, and Noah's wives, so that you have eight that came through the flood. And in other words, God was judging the world in that day. He was a preacher, Noah was, a preacher of righteousness. Now, what does that mean? That means just simply this, that in a day when there was rebellion against God, in a day when the world had become lawless, and we're told every thought and imagination of man's heart were evil continually, God moved in in a judgment of the flood and brought an end to that pre-Noatic world, that world that had become with the exception of one man and his family, had become totally a godless world. And you could well see that it wouldn't be long until the entire world would be in such a condition. God would have to judge it, and there would be salvation for no one after that. Actually, the judgment had in mind the future that was coming. And it reveals, actually, God's care and respect for the human life that he had created. Now, right after the flood, in order to curtail lawlessness and crime, God gave to man this edict. He says, "...he that sheddeth man's blood by man shall his blood be shed." This nonsense today of them using the argument against capital punishment and saying, it says, thou shalt not murder. Well, thou shalt not murder has reference to an individual who harbors hatred in his heart and expressing his own fleshly feelings in anger or hatred. He slays someone else, another human being. Well, friends, that's murder. But God has given to governments the authority to execute any man that takes another man's life. And why? Will you listen to me for just a moment. You show respect for human life, not by letting a criminal and a murderer off who destroys another human being, but you show respect and value for human life when you take the life of a murderer who fails to respect another human being. But... He despises a human being by killing him for some selfish or sinful reason. And today, the pendulum of the clock is over on the side of the criminal today. The sympathy goes to him. Oh, he's a human being. We don't want to take his life. But he took somebody else's life. And as a result, because we've had so many soft-hearted and soft-headed judges in this land today... And we're so far from God and God's Word that lawlessness became so bad in California that the majority of the people that voted back capital punishment, and it's almost impossible to enforce it. Why? Because of godless leaders that we have today. They know not God. They know not God's plan and program. And they think if you be lenient on a criminal, and as a result, instead of putting criminals in prison... They are running the streets today, and the honest citizens are in prison in their own home. I was in a home the other day. It was back east. They had a half a dozen locks on one door because they had been broken into, and they have a lovely home there. There are half a dozen locks there. Why? Because of the fact that criminals and thieves and murderers are abroad today. Now, you don't show respect for human life until they are locked up, my friends. That's when the dignity is shown. Now, that was the days of Noah, and it's that kind of a crowd that God destroyed and judged. You see, our nation has more than three strikes against us today. Not only, as I've said before, a nation of drunkards, alcoholics, But now, murderers and thieves, why, it's alarming. Why? Well, we came through a period, I came up under this period when I was in college. You didn't teach morals. 
because that's not the purpose. You see, after all, if you just educate little Willie, he's sort of like, you know, a cross between a piece of Dresden china and a hothouse orchid. And you don't want to apply the board of education to the seat of knowledge, because if you do, you might ruin his little umph, and he won't be able to express himself like a little flower. Well, little Will is expressing himself today, and he's a thief, he's a murderer, he's homosexual. And my friends, may I say to you, out of the human heart, the Lord Jesus said, proceed the ugliest, nastiest things that are imaginable. We need discipline. The unsaved world must have discipline from a government. If not, then that nation will be destroyed. That's number two. Now, number three, and the turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemn them with an overthrow, making them an example unto those that after should live ungodly. Now, Sodom and Gomorrah illustrates the flesh. And the flesh, he's going to talk about it in the remainder of this chapter, it's an ugly thing. You and I have that old nature, and it is a nature that when it expresses itself, it expresses itself in that which is ugly, and that which is wicked, that which is nasty. And today, you can't make me believe that all of this that was turned up down at Houston of this group of homosexuals. And now we find that there is an organization of them throughout the country today. You can't make me believe, friends, that by passing a law and making this lawful today, that somehow or another you've added dignity to it. God has said that when they go down that low, God gives them up. Now, that's the Word of God. And you can take it or leave it, but that's what the Word of God says today. And the very fact that we have been lenient and smile on that type of thing has caused it to increase and grow within our land. A couple wrote me the other day, and it's the saddest letter, and it's one of the types of letters I never read on radio. And they told me about they had found out their son had gone to college, came back a homosexual. How tragic, how terrible it was, and what a heartbreak it was to this couple. Now, in the city of Sodom and Gomorrah, there lived a man, and we are going to find out about him here. And I want to read verse 7. And delivered just Lot, vexed with the filthy manner of life of the wicked, for that righteous man dwelling among them and seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. Now, the word that interests me here, first of all, is that word vex. And it doesn't, to my thinking, convey what actually Peter's really saying here. Now, the word in the Greek, and I've been referring to that in the epistle of Peter, because of the fact that this man, they say, that does not use good Greek. And yet I've had to look up more words in the Greek that he's used than even Paul the Apostle. Now, the word here that he uses is katoponeo. And it means, according to Trench, to tire down with toil, to exhaust with labor. It means to afflict to oppress with evil, actually to torment. You know that one of the methods that communism has used, and apparently it's used now in many places, even in our own country, that you can break down an individual by constantly putting him under a bright light and constantly plaguing him with questions and pulling out his fingernails and doing all manner of torture to him. Well, this word has that in it. This man, Lot, in the city of Sodom, he vexed his soul. He was never happy there. He was tormented 
on the inside. It was torture for him to live in Sodom. And I never got that impression reading Genesis, by the way. And I'm glad Peter came along because I'm apt to say that I don't think Lot was saved. And I'll be honest with you, when I read the story back there of Lot, I come to the conclusion that when he went down to the city of Sodom, he went overboard and he lost most of his family and the two single daughters that he got out with him. When you read the story, you sort of wish they'd stayed back there in the city. But the interesting thing is that God got him out of the city of Sodom. And all of this is given to us, we're told, as an example. Example of what? Well, first of all, may I say that I think that you and I are going to get two big surprises when we get to heaven. Number one will be there are going to be some people that are not there that we thought were going to make it. They won't be there. They really weren't genuine, but we thought they were. And then I think the biggest shock that we're going to get is this. There are going to be some people there that we never even suspected were real born-again children of God down here. Now, the reason is they didn't have very much of a testimony. I don't think this man Lot had any testimony at all. You remember when the angels came and said that the city of Sodom and Gomorrah are going to be destroyed? Why, he went around to his sons-in-law and he said, Say, I've got word from God. He's going to destroy this city. He's going to judge it. Let's believe. They ridiculed him. (laughs) Why, they said, We don't believe you, old man. The kind of life you've been living down here doesn't reveal to us that you have had very much faith and confidence in God. You see, he didn't have any testimony at all. And I would have come to the conclusion, if I only had Genesis, I'd be willing to make the statement, well, Lot didn't make it. He was not a saved man. But I can't say that because it says, and he delivered just Lot. Well, it doesn't mean just Lot. (laughs) Two of his daughters went with him and his wife went with him also. But she didn't get too far away. And delivered just Lot, who was tormented with the filthy manner of life of the wicked. He didn't go for that. He hated that. He was a just man. Now, that means he was justified before God because he trusted God as Abraham did. He and Abraham were related. This man, Lot, trusted God, but he didn't lead a life like Abraham that was a testimony to the world. Lot stands on the page of Scripture as a saint of God who was justified because of his faith, but his life denied everything that he believed, and he never had a moment's peace down here. Now, the interesting thing is that this man dwelling among them, seeing and hearing, just think of the filth that that man had to listen to. Think of all of that. Very candidly, I do not believe a child of God can ever engage continually in filthy conversation. And filthy conversation will lead to filthy action, as we'll see in this chapter as we move down through it. Now, there's another lesson here, and it's the greatest lesson of all. And it's this. God said to this man, Lot, you'll have to get out of the city. And he said, I can't destroy. And back up yonder was a man by the name of Abraham who was not criticizing Lot, He was praying for him. And by the way, that's a good lesson for many of us. I asked a man the other day, he's a preacher, and he's been a friend of mine, but he criticizes everything and everybody today, and he criticized an outstanding Bible teacher today, one that I have respect for and know that God has mightily used him, and this man is criticizing him. And I said to him, looking him right straight in the eye. I said, have you ever prayed for him? And he turned red, and he said he hadn't. Well, I said, instead of criticizing him, why don't you pray for him? Pray for him if you think he's wrong. Now, Abraham, you remember, prayed for the city of Sodom. Oh, God, if there are 50 righteous down there, 
And he wanted his nephew to be spared. And he didn't think he would be because he stopped at ten. He was afraid that Lot was not really a child of God. But he was. And God got him out. God says, I can't destroy the city till you get out. And Miss Lot went with him. Now, she turned and looked back, turned to a pillar of salt. Now, somebody says, that sounds strange, just turning and looking back. Well, my friend, it's what turning and looking back means. Why did she look back? Because she might have walked out of Sodom, but she left her heart back in Sodom. Because I tell you, she was intertwined in everything that took place in that time. She belonged to the country club, the Shakespeare club, and every other kind of club. The bridge club. And they were having a meeting that afternoon anyway, and she wanted to go. And I think she plagued Lot and said, why do we have to leave like this? And then another reason is she turned and looked back because she didn't believe God had destroyed the city. He did. Turned her to a pillar of salt, and God got Lot out. My friend, may I say this to you? That at the time of the rapture, it'll take place before the great tribulation comes, before the judgment comes, because God will not let any of his saints, even those that are like Lot, the weakest saint, will be taken out. If Lot made it, and you have trusted Christ as your Savior, you can be sure of one thing, you're going out too. This is another marvelous example of the fact the church does not go through the great tribulation period. They've been justified by faith in Christ, and this man was justified. Now, will you notice, verse 9, "...the Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations, out of testing." Now, somebody says, I believe the church is going through the great tribulation. I'd just like to say to you, God knows how to deliver his own. You may not know how, but God knows how. And he also knows how to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. Now, God knows the difference between the two. I don't. The wheat and tares are growing together today. And he said to his own, you let them alone. Let them both grow together. I'm not worried about tares today. Oh, I must confess, I wish there weren't so many of them. But wheat and tares are growing. And the Word of God is getting out today. This is a glorious day in which to live. One of these days... He'll make the separation when he takes his own out of this world. Now he goes on in verse 10, "...but chiefly them that walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness." Now, this is a very strong statement here. It actually means defilements, in the defilements of uncleanness. This is a picture, actually, of those that are really like, well, as we're going to see, they're like animals. But they are those that delight in that which is vulgar, that which is vile, that which is vicious. They relish it. And we're told here that they despise government. Now, I don't believe, as so many of the commentators I've read have said that it means government down here. I have reason to believe, since this word occurs so few times in the Word of God, that it really means dominion. And we'll find it again in the 8th verse of Jude. It was back in Ephesians. And it had to do there with spiritual governments. And actually, it is those that despise that which is spiritual, that is, that which is above us, that which God has ordained above us, the angels, and the way God is running his universe. These are the ones that ask God to damn everything under the sun. They are not pleased, apparently, with anything. And not only that, presumptuous are they. And that, by the way, means they are daring. They are daredevils. They don't mind blaspheming. It makes them feel expansive and big to use language like that. Presumptuous are they. Self-willed. That is, 
They are going to do their own thing. They are not afraid to speak evil of dignities. And the word here for dignities is actually glories. That is, they speak evil of that which is sacred, that which is holy today. Isn't it interesting that men take God's name in vain? They don't take the city's name in vain or their boss's name in vain or some person they hate. They don't take their name in vain, but they take God's name in vain. They're not afraid to speak evil of dignities, glories, this order that God has established in his universe. Now he says, verse 11, "...whereas angels who are greater in power and might bring not railing accusation against them before the Lord." Now, these are lifted up, you see, with pride. And they do something that angels don't dare do. Now, when we get over to the little epistle of Jude, you'll find out that he gives a specific instance there that when Michael was disputing with Satan about the body of Moses, you see, the devil didn't want Moses to appear later on in the promised land. So there was some dispute, and God buried Moses, the body of Moses. And we're told that Michael would not bring against him a railing accusation, but he just said, the Lord rebuke you. And again, here is a spirit that today we need to manifest. And that is a spirit of humility in the sense we are turning all of this over to God. It's pride that causes us to speak as we do. And when I hear someone today, even a Christian, talking about the devil and ridiculing him and calling him names, I'll say this, Michael the archangel wouldn't do that. And if he is exalted as he is, wouldn't do it. A little man down here needs to be very careful. We're going to have more to say about that when we get to Jude. Now, will you notice verse 12? But these as natural brute beasts. And actually, it means wild animals. These are natural wild animals. They are made to be taken and destroyed, speak evil of the thing that they understand not, and shall utterly perish in their own corruption. Now, I want you to notice several things here. These apostates are like animals. And we hear a great deal today about man descending from an animal. And when we get to Obadiah, we'll find out that both the Old Testament and the New Testament make it very clear that man can live lower than the animals today. He's not descended from anything. He's right down with them, if you please, and lives like an animal. And he'll use that illustration in this chapter here a little bit later on. They are natural animals, wild animals made to be taken and destroyed. That is, just like an animal is taken. They've descended to that low plane, and they've reached the plane where they're hopeless and helpless. They speak evil of the things that they understand not. Now, here is something that has amazed me from the very beginning to the time I became a Christian, the fact of how smart some men can be who are not Christians and not at all understand the Word of God. There have been many brilliant men in the past, but have no knowledge of what the Word of God is about. Wilberforce in England, he was an alcoholic actually and lived a very fast life, and he was in the House of Lords or Commons, I'm not sure which, and Burke was his friend. And when Wilberforce was converted, he wanted Burke to hear one of the great preachers of Scotland. And when they were up there, he took him to hear him. And afterward, he was interested to get the reaction that he had to the sermon. And the reaction was very simple. It revealed something. He said, you know, says, that man is a brilliant orator, isn't he? But what was he talking about? Now, here is Burke, one of the great 
English statesman. When he heard a gospel message, he said, I don't even know what he's talking about. And I was very much interested to read recently of a great denomination in this country, a church that has preached justification by faith down through the years, that they made a survey and found out that 40% of the members believe they're saved by works, their own works. How tragic it is to see today that people do not even understand the gospel at all. Many that have been hearing it year in and year out. They do not understand. And that's what he says here. They speak evil of the things that they understand not and shall utterly perish in their own corruption. Now, you remember before he talked about pollution. He said that we've escaped the corruption of the world, the child of God. But these have not escaped the corruption. These today, some of them have escaped the pollutions, we are told, of the world. That is, there are a great many lost sinners today that say, I wouldn't do this thing that this low-down individual's doing, and he won't. He has escaped the pollutions, but he has not escaped the corruptions. In other words, outside he's religious. He goes through forms. He does certain works. But his heart is not right with God at all, and he has a corrupt heart, and he's done nothing about that whatsoever. Now I read verse 13 and shall receive the reward of unrighteousness as they that count it pleasure to revel in the daytime. Spots they are in blemishes, reveling with their own deceivings while they feast with you. Now, I want to make a rather strong statement here, and that statement is just simply this, that here in verse 13 and in the next verse, we're going to see the utter corruption of the human heart. You see, when a man thinks wrong, he's going to act wrong. You just can't escape that. And we find today that there are a great many people that feel like, this is my life, I can live it and do as I please. And we have men today in government that are immoral, definitely immoral. I mean, it's well known. They have affairs with other women that are not their wives. We know that most of them drink, and many of them drink to excess today. And they say, this is my business. My private life is my business. My friend, their private life is not their business if they're representing this government and representing my country. I want to say to you that if it's their private life, then get out of where they are, because they are hurting their country today, and they're hurting us. They say, this is my life, I'll do as I please. Well, my friend, we want men in government that are men that are sober, men that are honest, men that are moral men. These are the things that are desperately needed today. And he goes on to say, verse 14, "...having eyes full of adultery, and that cannot cease from sin." beguiling unstable souls and heart. They have exercised with covetous practices, cursed children. My, this is harsh language that he uses. And don't think, my friend, that God doesn't intend to judge them someday. Now, they not only are guilty of all of these immoral excesses, but notice verse 15, who have forsaken the right way, and are gone astray following the way of Balaam. Now, we have Balaam mentioned three times in these last books. And here's the first one, the way of Balaam. We'll have the era of Balaam in Jude, and the doctrine of Balaam in Revelation. And each one is different. And here is the way of Balaam. What is the way of Balaam? Well, let's keep reading. He's the son of Beor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. Now, he knew that he should not go and prophesy against Israel. But he loved the price that was being offered him. He was a covetous man. 
but was rebuked for his iniquity, the dumb ass speaking with man's voice, forbade the madness of the prophet. Why, he was mad to go. And that jackass that he was riding spoke to him. As some wag has said that in the old days, it was a miracle when a jackass spoke. And now, in our day, it's a miracle when one of them keeps quiet. Well, here you have one that spoke, and he spoke to Balaam. He rebuked him. Why? Because of his covetousness. And friends, I believe that you will find that the religious racketeer, I think you can judge him by the house he lives in, by his standard of living, by the car he drives, and about the money that he spends. You can generally judge him in that way. I knew one of them that was a religious racketeer. He lived in a $75,000 home, would be today a $250,000 home. And a friend of mine, when he heard me say one day on radio, why don't you go around and check up on the radio broadcaster, see where he lives, see what kind of home he lives in, see his standard of life. What car does he drive? He said, I thought that, speaking to me, he said, and this man's a friend of mine, he said, I just thought you were wrong and that you shouldn't have made a statement like that. But he said, I thought I'd check up. And he went out, checked up. He said, this man living at that time in what would be a $250,000 home today, he said there were two Cadillacs parked out front, and there was a swimming pool. And he said, I heard about some things in his life. And he said, I came to the conclusion I was supporting the wrong thing. The way of Balaam. The way of Balaam. Covetousness. And that's the way that a false religious teacher, one of the ways he can be identified. And God will judge him for that. Now, I move on. This is really harsh language, is it not? Now, we find here some of the things that can be said about them. And... Here is one of them. These are wells without water, clouds that are carried with a tempest to whom the mist of darkness is reserved forever. As a boy, I lived in West Texas, and we left the third year of a drought that had lasted three years. And I could remember that when we would chop cotton, and believe me, in those days, cotton didn't grow well in that country anyway, but that little miserable cotton, and we'd go out and chop it, and those big thunderheads would come over, clouds would come over. And they would, late in the afternoon, get together, there'd be lightning. And you'd think, my, we're going to have rain. But we didn't have rain. How dry it was. And today, how many people are following leaders like that. They are wells without water. They are clouds. They're beautiful clouds. They use beautiful flowery language. And they soar to the heights oratorically. And they use a basso profundo voice. Oh, how tremendous it is to see these folk. They are very impressive, friend. But there's no water in the well and there's no rain in the clouds. And people are starving today for the Word of God, and they're not being given the Word of God. You see, they do something else here. For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they soar to the heights oratorically, and they use beautiful language. They allure through the lusts of the flesh, you see, religion that appeals to the eye, religion that appeals to the ear, a religion that appeals even to the nose, incense. The preacher said to me, he says, I always have my church sprayed on Sunday morning. <laughs> and he's a Protestant, by the way. He says, I have it sprayed. He wants it to smell good, you see. And don't misunderstand me. I think a place ought to look nice and Music ought to be good music, and I don't mind the smell. But when those things are depended on, you see, they are the lusts of the flesh, through which wantonness, those that are just escaping from them who live in error. And how tragic it is to see folk like that. 
this man, Simon Peter, is really being sarcastic now. He says, while they promised them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption. Some habit has them bound, and yet they're promising liberty to others. But they don't know what liberty really is. For of whom a man is overcome of the same is he brought in bondage. So this is a picture that we have before us here. They promise liberty, but they don't know what it is themselves. Now, verse 20, "...for if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world..." Now, the pollutions of the world is what we were talking about, that which is outside. They say, why, I'm very religious. I belong to a certain liberal church. We don't believe in anything. We just talk about love and brotherhood, but we don't practice much of it. But nevertheless, we talk about it a great deal. Makes you feel good, you see. And we have a beautiful service. And we have a beautiful church. They've escaped the pollution. This man read with horror what happened over yonder in Houston, Texas, when that group of boys that were slain by this homosexual, how horrible it is. And he was horrified by it. But you see, he's escaped the pollutions of the world, but not the corruptions. Through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in it. Now, it's not that they haven't heard the gospel. They've heard the gospel. These men have heard it. I'm meeting people all across this country today. One man that told me that he didn't believe a thing. He doubted whether there was a God. He says, I listen to you nearly every day. May I say to you that this man knows the gospel. And somebody said to me one time, I was playing golf with him. He says, why don't you present the gospel to him? I said, he's heard me present the gospel over a hundred times. There's no need of saying any more. They are again entangled in it and overcome. The latter end is worse with them than the beginning. Now, friends, I'm going to read verses 21 and 22 that conclude the second chapter of Second Peter. I'm reading now. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. But it happened unto them according to the true proverb, The dog is turned to his own vomit again, and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. Now, this chapter has dealt in a very definite way with the apostasy that was coming on the earth and into the church through false teachers who were creeping in, slipping into the church, and teaching false doctrines. That is, that which is contrary to the Word of God. And he has been speaking of how they have perverted the truth of God, and they do it for their own advantage. And the way that these false teachers can be identified, he's made it very clear. They exalt themselves instead of exalting Christ. And they do not use the Word of God except a few little proof texts that more or less clothe it with a pious halo. And then they use counterfeit words. And they're spoken of here as great swelling words. They use big words. They try to impress people that they're very intellectual. And they do something else. They're interested in making money. And they claim that they can change people. And sometimes, and I know I'll get in trouble by saying this, but I think that you ought to examine very carefully anyone who claims that they have a supernatural power to heal or to perform miracles. might be well to check into them. And sometimes one of the things that identify them is that they live in secret, in lust and sin. 
and you and I can't fight them. I'm not attempting to fight them. I'm just trying to expose them. But one day God's going to expose them. And now he concludes this by saying that it would actually have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness. It had been better for them than having known it to turn from the gospel. Now, I have done something in my ministry which has not been original at all. I heard the late Dr. A.C. Gabeline use it, and it was so effective and so true that I have used it on many occasions. I conclude the message by saying, friends, if you are here today and you've come in here unsaved and you walk out of here unsaved, I'm the worst enemy that you've ever had because of the fact that you've heard the gospel and you could never go into the presence of God and tell him that you had never heard the gospel because you have heard it. And it's worse for you than any heathen in the darkest part of the earth today. And I'm not going to discuss the heathen, but I am talking about the heathen that sits in the church pew today and rejects the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, some of them become very religious. And Peter speaks of them using the term dog, and it's nothing lower than a dog, by the way. And the dog is turned to its own vomit again. Think of that. And the sow that was washed, she's gone back to her wallowing in the mire again. Now, actually, it's Simon Peter who gives us the parable of the prodigal pig. Now, you may not have heard about the parable of the prodigal pig, but here it is. And it's, of course, based on the parable of the prodigal son. Now, you remember the Lord Jesus gave that parable. It's one of the greatest parables that he ever gave. And there are those that are extreme, and they say you can't preach the gospel from it. Well, the first time that I ever went forward in a meeting was under a brush arbor in southern Oklahoma, a little place called Springer. And it's not much of a place today, I'm told, and it certainly wasn't in my day. But I went forward and knelt, and all I remember that night was that the preacher preached on the prodigal son. And I remember the figures of speech that he used, and believe me, it was a very effective message, and I'm confident others got saved, but nobody took the time to explain to me about the gospel, and I didn't really understand it that night. But my heart was certainly open for it, and my life afterward revealed I wasn't saved. And that man, he took the prodigal son through a whole of nightclubs and the sin places, and all the saints that night, they sinned vicariously. But it was a very convincing message, I know that. But actually, the story of the prodigal son is not how a sinner becomes a son, but it's how a son becomes a sinner. It's a familiar story, and I'm not going into any detail there. You remember that father that had these two boys, and one of these boys, the youngest, he wanted to take off for the far country, and Dr. Streeter called that the sin of propinquity. That's a big word, but it just simply means this, that things near at hand are not so attractive. But the far away places, they have an allurement. They have an enchantment. They have something that's quite wonderful. After all, I think the chief allurement of sin is its mystery. The old bromide grass is greener on the other side of the fence. And that's the story of this boy. And so he ran away, and he soon lived it up. When he had plenty of money, why, the fair-weather friends were with him, but they soon faded away. And he ended up by actually having to go out and get a job working for a man that raised pigs. And when he said that, the publicans and Pharisees both winced because a Jewish boy could have sunk no lower than that. He hit bottom. He was on drugs and sex, and he could have joined the Manson family, or he could have been one of those down in Houston, Texas, in that homosexual orgy 
and murder ring that they had there. This boy was down in the pig pen. Now the question arises, what about the boy? Someone came and asked the late Dr. Rimmer, the question says, suppose the boy died in the pig pen. What then? Dr. Rimmer said, well, if he died in the pig pen, there's one thing for sure. He never would have been a dead pig. He was a son. He was a son when he left home, friends. He was a son when he got to far country. He was a son when he's living in sin. And he is a son when he got in the pig pen. And because he was a son, he had to make a statement one day, and no pig could ever make that statement. He says, my father is up yonder in that great big home, and he's got servants that are better off than I am, and I'm his son, and I'm living way down here. And he says, I will arise, and I'll go to my father. Now, no pig can say that unless he's going the opposite direction. Now, the question is going to be, what's the father going to do with the boy? Well, according to the Mosaic law, and I'll not turn to it, but in Deuteronomy 21, 18, that boy was to have been stoned to death. Well, may I say to you that he wasn't stoned to death. He went back and he began his confession. He says, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. And he wasn't able to finish it. The father wouldn't let him. Instead of saying what you'd expect him to do, at least you would expect him to say to a servant, you go down and cut me off some hickory limbs and bring them back to me. I'm going to whip this boy in an inch of his life. He's disgraced my name. He's spent my substance. He's wasted his time. And he's been in sin, and I'm going to teach him. But that's not what happened. The boy, you see, got his whipping in the far country. All prodigals get their whipping when they're away from home. When you come back to the heavenly Father... There's always a banquet there for you in a robe and a ring. And it says that they began to be merry. They never did end it. The fun was up at the father's house, never in the pig pen. But the interesting thing is, Peter says something here. The sow, this old pig that was washed and all cleaned up. What happened to her? She's returned to her wallowing in the mire. So now we can add something to the parable of the prodigal son. One of those little pigs, you know, said to the prodigal son, Say, prodigal son, you say you want to leave this lovely pig pen with all of the nice mud and goo that we have here and go up to the father's house, your father's house? Well, it sounds good. In fact, you've sold me. I think I'd like maybe to go up there and try. And so the prodigal son told him, he says, now, if you go up there, things are sure going to be different. You're going to have to clean up. And so when they got up there, and by the way, when the father put his arms around that boy, and he said, you remember, bring forth a robe that he could smell those clothes that he'd been wearing in the pig pen. And what he really meant was you give him a good bath, then put a new robe on him. He can't smell like that in my house, and he can't live like that. And so that little pig that went up with him got all cleaned up. They washed this little pig up nicely and tied a pink ribbon around its neck and washed its teeth with pepsodent. And the little old pig went squealing through the house. But it wasn't long. In a couple of days, the little pig with a downcast look came and said to the prodigal son, said, prodigal son, I don't like it here. And the son said, we're having the best time I've ever had in my life since I came home. And you say that you don't like it here. What's wrong? Well, he says, you know, I don't like this idea of having white sheets on the bed. If we could just get to a place where there's plenty of good and sloppy mud, I could sleep better there. And the prodigal son says, we just don't do that here in the father's house. You can't just live in a pig pen here. You can't do it. And the little pig says, another thing I don't like is sitting at a table using a knife and fork and having a white tablecloth and eating out of a plate. He says, why couldn't we have a trough down on the floor and put everything in there and we could all jump in and have the biggest time of your life? Prodigal son said, we don't do that here. And the little 
pig says, well, I think I'll arise and go to my father. And you want to know something? His old man wasn't in that house. And he started back home. He'd been all cleaned up. But he got inside of that pig pen. And when he got inside of that pig pen, he saw his old man. You know where he was? Right down in the middle of the biggest loblolly that you've ever seen. Mud all around him. Dirty, filthy, smelling. And the little old pig began to squeal and made a leap for it and jumped in right by the side. And he said, Old man, I sure am glad to get back home. You know why? He was a pig. He was a pig. And this little pig went to the father's house. The other little pig stayed at home, and their home was a pig pen. And this little pig said, I can't get over the door sill up at the father's house. And he said, I'm going to return back to the pig pen. Why? Now, may I say to you, that poses a problem. And may I mention the problem? I had the privilege of big pastor in downtown Los Angeles right after World War II. That is, sometime after I began in 1949. Those were the years when all these subdivisions were beginning to be built in Southern California. That's the period that the population out here doubled again and again. People came from everywhere. And we saw a tremendous in gathering during that period. I've always thanked the Lord that he gave me the privilege of being in a unique position at the right time. And I was there at the right time. It was a great time. And I so many folk turned to the Lord. But there was always a problem. And the problem was this. It was how to tell the pigs from the real born-again Christians. It was really difficult, and it's rather confusing. It was also the beginning of the building of freeways. And I found out that at one end of the freeway was the father's house, and at the other end of the freeway there was a pig pen. And I learned this. There were always prodigal sons that were going back to the father's house. And I've talked to many of them. I talked to a preacher's son one time. He came in to see me. He's a handsome young man. He came out to make Hollywood, and he was good-looking. But he's just one of those that didn't have the charisma and didn't quite make it. And he got with the wrong crowd, began to drink. And he saw that he was going down and down. And he was a prodigal son. He wasn't a pig. He hated all of that. He came in to me, and he said, I want to go home. And he says, my dad is a wonderful man, but I let him down. I just don't know how he'd receive me, and I don't know whether I should go home or not. And I said, I'll tell you what you do. Let me call him. And he said, all right. And I said, if he doesn't want to talk to you, why, we'll just hang up. He said, fine. So I called this man, and he answered the phone. He's a very fine minister. And I said to him after, you know, we exchanged a few pleasantries, you know, about the weather, how wonderful it is in California and how bad it was back where he was. And so I could see, wondered why I was calling him. And I said to him, I have somebody here in my study that would like to talk to you. And he knew who it was because he knew that boy wasn't a pig. He was a son. And the father broke down and he says, is it my boy? And I said, yes. He said, let me talk to him. And the boy began to weep. And I'm sure the father was weeping when I got off the phone. He was weeping, and so I just walked out of the study. And when I came back in after he hung up, the boy said, I'm going home. And that was always confusing for me because sometimes prodigal sons are on the other side of the freeway going down to pig pens. And we've had a lot of them in Southern California went down to pig pens. And the thing that adds to the confusion is this, that sometimes a pig will get out of the pig pen and go up to the father's house. But he's a pig. He won't like it up there. And he gets all washed and cleaned up, and you have difficulty telling him. He becomes very religious. Sometimes he's made him a deacon in the church. You just can't tell, because he's all cleaned up on the outside. But inside, he has the heart of a pig. 
And a pig loves the mire. And I learned this. In all that confusion of pigs going both directions and prodigal sons going both directions, as a lady came to me one day and said, I knew this man, he's out here now drinking. He's divorced his wife. He's running around. And I can remember when he was superintendent of a Sunday school, and he was a deacon too, back east. And she said, is he saved or not saved? And I said, I don't know. She said, you mean you're preaching? Don't know whether that man's saved? I said, no, really, I couldn't tell you. Because all I can see is the outside. I said, I'll tell you, though, what we'll do, and I've learned this. I said, I am here in a great metropolitan area where there's a freeway that has the pig pen at one end and the father's house at the other. And I've learned to wait. And if you wait long enough, all the pigs are going to get back to the pig pen and all the sons are going to get home to the father's house. Just just wait and see. If that man continues to live in the pig pen that you mentioned, we can know who he is. He's a pig because the pig that was washed has now returned to her wallowing in the mire. That's what Peter says. That's the parable of the prodigal pig, by the way. And so we see this is the mark of the apostate. This is a frightful picture, and I know of no picture in the Word of God that's more frightful than this, than the 17th chapter of Revelation. And we'll be getting to that one of these days. Now, I'm going to conclude with a poem that a friend of mine wrote. In fact, a member of the church, after I preached one Sunday on the parable of the prodigal pig. Now, will you listen to as much as I can get in? Come home with me, said the prodigal son. We'll sing and dance and have lots of fun. We'll wine and dine with women in song. You'll forget you're a pig before very long. So the pig slipped out while Mama was asleep, shook off the mud from the mire so deep. Round his neck was a bow so big, he's going to show the world a pig's not a pig. With his snout in the air, he strolled along with the prodigal son who was singing a song. It must be great to be a rich man's son. He would surely find out ere the day was done. It didn't take him long to realize his mistake. He'd been scrubbed and rubbed till his muscles ached. He squealed when they put a gold ring in his nose and winced with pain when they trimmed his toes. He sat at the table on a stool so high, a bib round his neck and a fork to try, while the prodigal son in his lovely robe kept feeding his face, so glad to be home. When the meat came round, the pig gave a moan. It looked too much like a kind of his own. He jumped from his chair with a grunt and a groan, darted through the door and headed for home. His four little feet made the dust ride high, for he didn't stop till he reached that sty. It's what's on the inside that counts, my friend, for a pig is a pig to the very end. 